Good evening, everyone. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Camson. I am the president of Arizona Costume Institute. Um, I'm so excited that you guys are here tonight. Um, Arizona Costume Institute started in 1966 with a group of women that really appreciated history, preservation, and art in regards to fashion. Our mission is fashion as art, and uh, we are happy to continue that mission and share that tonight with um, our special speaker guest, uh, who we'll find out, or who we'll hear from later. Um, just wanted to let you know about some of our upcoming events. November 10, we have a cocktails and fashion conversation, and it's a focus on local fashion here uh, with fabric that is in Tempe and also the Garment District, um, Garment League, I apologize. Um, December 6, we have our annual holiday luncheon a fundraiser, which is our biggest fundraiser of the year, and it's really quite fantastic. Um, we still have some tickets left, but I will tell you, it is always a sold out event. So if you're interested, please get your tickets now. Um, we have a calendar of events um, that is online, and um, if you need some more information about that, you can ask any of our members, and we can give you that information. Um, tonight, we have a special program in mind. Our um, Jackie Durant's curator of fashion design, Helen Jean, will be interviewing a wonderful designer here, um, Jared Yazzie. And um, actually, I guess no more from me out now. It's my privilege to introduce Helen Jean. Thank you. Good evening. Sorry, let me do that again. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I haven't spoken publicly in so long, it got cut. Um, I'm so glad to see you all here. Thank you for coming out. I know this is still a strange time to be getting together, and I'm just, I'm so thankful that you're here. It's really special to get to be together and to share information and talk about our shared love of fashion because that's why we're all here tonight, right? Um, so first of all, thank you, Camson, for that introduction. Thank you, ACI. Do we have ACI members? Can you wave at me? Because I, I want to see you all. Thank you so much, ACI members, new members. It's marvelous to have you here. Friends and family, thank you for coming out. What about students? Do we have students in our audience tonight? Yay, students. Thank you for coming. It's always wonderful when we have our students out at the museum. Um, we have a special initiative that we started um, just uh, in the last two years where we've been putting out a challenge for students to share with us how our exhibitions and the work that we do here inspire the, the work that they're doing as young designers. So we invited students to enter a design competition tonight um, inspired by the um, Fashion Subversives exhibition upstairs and this concept of fashion as protest that we're talking about tonight. So we've had student submissions. Uh, they've been available online to vote. I know there was information at the table when you came in, so I think the voting is going to continue for just a little bit longer, and then we'll announce the winner at the end of this evening. All right, let's dive in. So we're here tonight to talk about the different ways that clothing has been used to connect and unite people during moments of social unrest. Teen Vogue said it best in November 2020 when they commented that organizers have used fashion to give visual currency to different socio-political movements. It's this concept of visual currency that we're really going to focus on this evening. We're not here to debate or challenge the different protests that have gone on. What well, our purpose tonight is to identify the different moments where fashion has been that codifying item, that, that thing that helps bring people together to identify, oh, we're, we're standing up for the same thing. You're here for that, I'm here for that. My hat said it, my button said it. We're looking for those instances that tie us together as a community. Um, this quote, the history of dress is a history of protest. This appeared in 1951 in the third issue of History Today um, by Quentin Bell. He was an artist, an author, and nephew of Virginia Woolf. And he wrote this quote at a time when young people were beginning to dress in ways that were antithetical to their parents, choosing instead to dress and create their appearance as an expression of their excitement, their aspirations, their frustrations, basically a reflection of the changing times. 
Um, before we dive into the different historic ex historical examples that we're going to look at, first we need to define what protest means here. So protest is a statement or action that's expressing disapproval of or objection to something. But let's think about the different ways that we've all experienced protest. It can be really loud and bombastic, and it's, it's, it's outdoors, and it's yelling, and it's chanting, and it can be anger, and it can be violence, and it's energy, and it's physical, and it's social. Protest can be really quiet and hypnotic. It can have chanting and poems. There can be verse, voices mingling. It can be a very internal experience. Protest can be very quiet, like sit-ins or knit-ins, or nurse-ins. These are all moments of protest. Protests can be very desperate. Hunger strikes, the martyrdom that we witnessed in Tiananmen Square in 1989. And clothing can serve as a social motivator in all of these moments. Clothing can be an agitator. Let's see if we can get that up. Like our pink pussy hat, the name, the shape, it's all intended to make you pay attention and to ask questions and to find out why are we wearing this hat. Fashion can help intimidate, and that can help with a protest. Think about punk rock, these crusties jackets. They're very individual. They're, they're, they're anarchistic. Fashion can be defiance. These bathing suits are from the 1930s. Read the sign. Law requires full bathing suits. Fashion can be, clothing can be uh, oppressive. I mean, it can, not in this image, um, but ensembles that are intended to strike fear. If we think of the Gestapo uniform, if we think of the KKK costume, this is very intentional. It's meant to intimidate. Fashion can also unify. The pink ribbons that we wear for breast cancer, sashes that we wear when we want to unite and march for rights. Tonight, we're going to look at different examples, mostly chronological. Um, so let's dive in. We're going to start in the Middle Ages. So has anybody heard about sumptuary laws before? We've heard about sumptuary laws. Sumptuary laws are laws that are enacted to control what you wear, what you eat, where you go, who you talk to, what you talk about. It's intended to control a population for a variety of reasons. Um, but governing an appearance and regulating these experiences is really very common. Sumptuary laws date all the way back to the Greco-Roman period. In the Middle Ages, between about 1200 to 1500, Italy alone had uh, over 300 sumptuary laws, which was more than all of Europe combined at this time. So they were really clamping down on fashion. And there's a few reasons for this. But let's keep in mind, these sumptuary laws came with some really serious um, punishments. There was flogging. There could be imprisonment. Um, there could even be excommunication as punishment for wearing the wrong thing, wearing whatever was outlawed for whatever reason. So sumptuary laws would be applied for a lot of different reasons. It was a really efficient way to discriminate, basically. It was a really clear way to get people to identify what religious group they're in, what cultural group that they identify with, and then that allows us to segregate people. That's a really unfortunate thing. Uh, it ensures a distinction between the, no, uh, the, between the classes, between the nobility and the rising social classes. And it also acted, sumptuary laws in Italy at this time also, interestingly, acted as a population stimulus. So this is right after uh, the Black Plague, and a majority of Italy's population has just disappeared. And now all of a sudden, we have a generation of people who just received their entire family's wealth and they've never had money like this before. And all of a sudden, we see a generation of people moving from investment spending to luxury spending. Um, dowries, wedding costs skyrocket, and really reasonable options aren't really out there. So we need to build a new population. So sumptuary laws were also a part of helping to redirect funds back into creating a family instead of throwing giant lavish parties. So let's take a look at some sumptuary laws during this period. Hold on. Sumptuary laws were enacted through the clergy. So this came, it was enacted through different religious uh, edicts. And so it's, what I wanted to point out here is the different ways that the, the, the figures are dressed in this image, it gives you an idea of 
the size of the hat, the color of the cape, the amount of ornamentation, we know who's in charge. We know the other groups of people, we know who's related to who because of what they're wearing and how they're dressed. And this um, hierarchy of clothing and the way that we're identifying it from the clergy is what really rolled into our social system of, I'm wearing this, therefore I am a higher status than you. So let's take a look at some sumptuary laws that were enacted in Italy at the time. So this is a type of shoe called a Chopin. These would lift you up off the street and, I mean, if you're in Venice and it's a little bit wet on the street, this is a great idea. But then we get these, right? This isn't needed. This isn't necessary. This is because I can make my skirt super long now if I have really, really tall shoes. And you get to see how much money I have because I'm so tall that I need help to go downstairs. I need help to walk through the plaza. I need help with every little thing. That's great. That's a real, very clear indicator that this person has a lot of money. Underneath these incredibly long skirts, then, we have these extended Chopins. So um, the sumptuary law was intended to keep the height to a reasonable level so that we, I mean, this is, a, this is a health risk. You could easily fall downstairs. So sumptuary laws had some purpose to them as well. All right, so sumptuary laws during this period disproportionately affected women. Uh, regulating their garments and accessories. Uh, in 1453, Nicola Santuzzi, and that, this is not her, this is just a beautiful portrait of someone from the period. Um, a Bolognese woman protested, who would be so torpid or idle? What woman so unlearned? What female so pulsanonymous that she would decline to speak in favor of the restoration, defense, and preservation of her ornaments? And this is recorded in uh, two sumptuary laws from 16th century Milan. These are not the tantrums of a spoiled rich woman. To fully appreciate the meaning um, of protesting these sumptuary laws, we need to place women's dress in the context of the family economy. At this time, a woman's value is completely tied to her husband, and that value is displayed and advertised through her clothing and accessories. A, clothing's, a woman's clothing at this time is her insignia of worth. And so attacking her appearance is attacking her. Let's jump uh, now to the French Revolution. So your look during the French Revolution identified whether you were a royalist or a revolutionary, and you better pick one side. There's not a lot of options. And things happened very fast. Um, over 17,000 people were led to the guillotine in the first year after the French Revolution during the Reign of Terror. So going outside with the wrong thing on had very literal and extreme uh, consequences. So if you are a royalist, you're on the left here, you're going to wear your tricorn hat with your uh, tricolored um, um, ribbons on it, you're going to have your lace, you're going to have your beautiful wig, you're going to have lace, your justicor, which is your jacket, your waistcoat, and your culottes. Those are your pants. They're called culottes at the time, and you wore them with your, ho your hosiery and your beautiful um, shoes. Now, if you're on the right, if you're a revolutionary, you have a very different look. And the key piece here is you're wearing long pants. This entire ensemble is called the sans culottes, without culottes, without short pants, long pants. These are the people who are working. This is, this is a practical outfit that's got you through the day in the field, in the machine, whatever it is you're doing all day long, because that's the revolution. It's the working man's revolution. Um, so another important point to this is the tricolored cockade, the colors of the French flag. We see the cockade on all kinds of uh, fun accessories and garments. And at one point there, uh, in 1792, there was a decree that men were required to wear the tricolored cockade. If you didn't, clearly, uh, you were a royalist. Another key look from this, another key piece from this look, is the hat. Okay, so this red, uh, red hat that we saw um, comes from two different sources in ancient Greece and Rome. The Greek source um, was um, a god Mithras uh, and the, on the left, and the Roman source, uh, sorry, and on the left, this is a hat um, 
that we called um, <laughs> just the Phrygian bonnet. And then on the right is the Roman version that we called the pilos. So our modern version of the red cap of liberty, right here that you see on our gentleman on the far right, is a blending of these two styles. Now, the hat on the left um, is called, uh, I'm sorry, the Phrygian bonnet. And the one on the right for the Roman cap is tied a lot to the moment when uh, slaves would be freed during the Roman period. And so it's that shape and that style of hat is also associated with the free man. So we've got this shape and this important um, meaning to the hat. So this style of hat emerges during the French Revolution as the cap of liberty. But then we also see it in a lot of other, uh, a lot of other places. This is uh, a fresco over the door of the Senate Committee on Appropriations at the US Capitol. This is um, the Roman goddess of war, Belliona, and she's wearing the red cap of liberty. Uh, the West Virginia and New Jersey flags both have red caps of liberty. You can see it lying in the foreground there, over two rifles on the ground, and that means that the state is ready to fight for liberty. We uh, see the red cap of liberty on um, the um, official seal of the US Army and the Senate. Dates all the way back to the Greco-Roman period and a key piece during the French Revolution. So are we trying to say that this one red hat has this magical power to help manifest freedom and liberty for the wearer and the movement? I and mean, that sounds kind of crazy, right? It's not. That's not crazy. I mean, we, we create numerous customs and mythologies with the intention of infusing phenomenal power into clothing and accessories. Um, think about sports teams. We have so much superstition around uniforms and colors and you can wear those socks on the sports day or don't wear the socks on the day that they play. Religious textiles. Lots of meaning there. There's ceremony around who can touch them and when you touch them. And it's really an important part of that process. We have hair, heirloom textiles, the quilt that you have that your grandmother made. That can time travel. You wrap yourself up in that and all of a sudden everything's fine and you're 40 years ago, right? That's amazing. It's just a textile. What about military patches? You sew those on. You're stitching protection for whoever that soldier is. Every stitch. That's helping that person to come back home, right? That's the intention. And it's true. You're putting that power in there. We count on that power to protect us when we're protesting. That's part of why we grab onto these things. It becomes part of our uniform, part of the armor when we're out there. All right, uh, let's jump to the 1850s. Um, an abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator, by William Lloyd Garrison, promoted women's sewing circles as a key place where the ideals of freedom and equality could be discussed and supported. This is a great quote. Sewing circles are among the best means for agitating and keeping alive the question of anti-slavery. A friend in a neighborhood town recently said to me, our sewing circle is doing finely and contributing very much to keeping up the agitation of the subject. Some of the members generally read an anti-slavery book or paper to the others during the meeting. And thus, some of us who don't get a great deal of anti-slavery information at home have an opportunity to hear it in the circle. So we're looking at protest in a lot of different ways. Protesting, using fashion to protest, using moments of fashion drawing us together to protest, to learn about protest. It's a big subject that we're covering tonight. Here's a look at what these sewing circles would look like uh, from the Civil War. All right, let's uh, move into um, women's suffrage. This is an exciting topic. If anyone's seen this image before, we colloquially call this the bloomer costume or the bloomer pantsuit. Um, it was originally introduced by Elizabeth Smith Miller. Um, she was an advocate and major financial supporter of the women's rights movement. Um, she introduced this to the New York social scene around 1851. This was very, very new. This is what everyone is wearing. This is what we're used to seeing at the time. Layers and layers and layers of skirts and petticoats and it's heavy and we've got corsets and under corsets and over corsets and layers and liners and a bodice and a skirt. It's a lot. It's a lot to wear. These are young girls. They don't look like they're having much fun at all. And they're definitely not running and skipping and playing and climbing trees. That's not happening. Um, so this is a very oppressive look for women to be wearing. 
So this look of the bloomer costume, again, that we call, uh, was introduced in 1851, and a woman named Amelia Jenkins Bloomer, who was an editor of a magazine called The Lily, loved this, loved this look. She wore it, she promoted it, and instantly everyone started calling it The Bloomer because of her magazine and her name tied to it. This look was really common in like utopian societies and at, 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 at health resorts, but it was not the common look on the street, and it was heavily ridiculed. I mean, savagely ridiculed. Um, and there's some really great comics out there, but the whole crux of the issue is that this, the, the concern is that women aren't gonna be women anymore, and it's gonna upset the whole social balance, and families are gonna fall apart, and the whole world's gonna explode, um, in a nutshell. All right, so this is a book, uh, uh, an image, uh, 1866, of Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, who was a surgeon during the Civil War. You better believe she wore the bloomer costume because she had things to do, she had a life, she had exciting things um, going on, and she, she didn't need to be wearing these giant skirts um, to get through her day. So as the, as the women's movement continued, members began to coordinate their look in two really significant ways. Um, uh, first, the sash, which is really key. Um, the sash, uh, the colors of purple for loyalty, white for purity, and yellow for the Kansas state flower, which is really the birthplace of some of the founding members of the women's suffrage movement. And then the second thing was to wear white underneath. Um, the reason for that was a couple of reasons. First of all, it's very unassuming. It's not threatening. Don't worry, we're not gonna take over the world. We're still wearing all white. We're gonna go have tea later. But in truth, what it does is from a crowd, you can see just how many people are wearing it. At this time period, dark colors are really, really favorable. The white tea dress, that's the middle of the day. So wearing this all day long or to the parade, it's a really great way of identifying yourself very quickly, as we can see here in this parade. 1914 in Boston. Okay, how about 2020 at the State of the Union address? This was an attempt to really make a show for the solidarity of women. All right, so that bloomer costume, it totally came back when we started riding bicycles. So in the late 1890s, we called it the Rationale. Um, so the, in 1888, the Rational Dress Society formed with a belief that restrictive clothing could actually damage your circulatory system and your internal organs. They weren't wrong. Um, and so bloomer costumes were turned for um, bicycling as sporting became more co-ed. Interestingly, if you look on the far left here, She's great, she's got pants on and she can ride a bike. However, her, the degree of tight lacing that's going on completely contradicts this new athletic physical lifestyle. So again, still there's just a lot of contradictory things at play. All right, let's move into the 1960s and look at the civil rights movement. Um, have you guys heard the term dress to the nines? That's where this comes from. The intention here is that nonviolent resistant methods are intended to, to dignify the movement and counteract racial stereotypes. Participants of the civil rights movement were encouraged to dress to the nines. The intentions behind that were that nothing showy or ostentatious was permitted because in order to break down these barriers, which won't happen if they didn't look serious and businesslike, it was a very intentional, very intentional mindset and presentation. In the same way that the civil rights leaders used dress to elevate the image of black livelihood, the Black Panther Party used dress to draw attention to black pride and liberation. Established in 1966 by Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton, Black Panthers drew inspiration from a, a, some, some military um, sources. The black leather jacket, that dates to World War II, bombers, bomber jacket. Uh, and, and those were the original Hells Angels from World War II. The, uh, they, uh, their uniform originated with a blue powdered shirt uh, for the Black Panthers, which then transitioned to the black uh, turtleneck. Black pants, black shoes, gloves, natural hair, 
and a black beret. That black beret is, key, is, is really key here. Black berets, um, the beret we see uh, in a lot of different, uh, different figures, but it was a really favored and loved symbol of Marxist leader Che Guevara, communist leader Fidel Castro. Um, we see early examples of the beret all the way back um, to uh, um, Spain and France in the 1800s. It's a very military um, uh, history to this hat. So but not all of our examples tonight are going to have really long historic backgrounds. And some of these examples are going to be born out of the violence that occurred in the moment. In 2012, um, the Trayvon Martin protests. The size of the public outcry after the acquittal of George Zimmerman was so great that this rolled into the Black Lives Movement that's still active today. Are we saying that the hoodie started the movement? No, of course we're not saying that. But the hoodie provided the visual currency to inspire others to join, to march, to demonstrate. And that's how fashion and clothing can help propel these movements forward. Sometimes it's the act of destroying or removing fashion and costume that functions as the protest. So this is the Miss America pageant in 1968, and this is a group called the New York Radical Women's Group. Like, who is ready to go join them right now? Because I'm ready. Let's go. This sounds like the best group of people. Um, and they were protesting the selling of women's bodies like meat um, uh, at, during this pageant. So. Um, they protested, and part of this protest was burning items of fashion and accessory as a demonstration. In uh, March of 1976, the New York Times reported that the Yale women's crew team stripped um, to protest a lack of crew showers. They staged this in the office of the Director of Physical Education with the words Title IX uh, painted across their chests with Yale blue paint. The concept of undressing as protest, it's, uh, it's, on its surface, it's a little bit confusing. So let's parse this out a little bit. Um, in, a, in an article um, on The Conversation by author Bright Alozi, she explains, to fully understand the symbolism, we must not view the protesting naked female solely in sexual terms, as a commodity, or as an object without regard to their dignity. These women represent power, subversion, resistance to the dominant scripts that have been engraved onto their bodies. Scripts of subordination, passivity, sexuality, subservience, and vulnerability. In Acholi uh, culture in Uganda, a woman stripping in public is thought to bring a curse on her enemies. In 2002, July 8th of 2002, 600 women participated in a naked protest from six different communities across Nigeria, protesting Chevron, Texaco, for uh, destroying their land and contaminating all of their water. In uh, 2015, a Uganda woman uh, strips to protest uh, government killings and land seizures. And in 2020, there's been re reports of Nigerian women, women, again, stripping to protest killings. These are, these are moments of desperation. It is critical that they get their message across. And it's a very, very clear demonstration. Um, in the 21st century, female-centric issues have been confronted in a variety of ways, ranging from stylish to unapologetic. We've got um, the blackout uh, event from the coordinating gowns of the 2018 Golden Globes that you can see here. This one was great, it was supportive, it's a little vanilla. We've got some more exciting ones. Um, the sea of pink pussy hats um, seen in the 2017 Women's March, which was the largest one day protest in history. We've got the dramatic red capes of The Handmaiden's Tale, which I bet are going to be haunting the halls of the Texas House for quite a while. And most recently, the changes in women's health care has inspired especially colorful and impactful protest garments. In other forms of protest, the human body has been completely removed. And the garment is void and it's allowed to stand alone, devoid of life and dimension. In 2010, artist Jamie Black created the Red Dress Project. 
Each dress represents a missing or murdered indigenous woman. It's inspired by um, after witnessing a, a, a group of women protesting in Bogota, Colombia. The artist was there and she witnessed 40 women in the city square all wearing red dresses and one woman climbed to the top of a statue and she yells, where are they? Where are they? And they stood there all day yelling for the people that they loved that disappeared. And she thought, I have to bring this energy home. And so she created this beautiful installation that's traveled across the United States and Canada. In fact, it was in Tucson this last winter if anyone had the opportunity to go see it. May 5th is now Red Dress Day in Canada. It took hold. People are paying attention. It's haunting to see. 21st century class warfare has had some new items and some old. Um, 2011, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, these protests became known. Uh, protesters uh, were wearing what is known as the Guy Fox mask. Guy Fox was um, one of the um, uh, members, uh, he was an Englishman that was attempting to assassinate King James I in 1605, and it was foiled, it didn't go off correctly, um, but his face and that moment um, were captured um, in a mask by illustrator David Loys, and it was popu became popular in the film V for Vendetta, which has uh, a lot of, of, of similar themes to it. In 2018, we have the Yellow Vest movement in France, uh, protesting a fuel tax that disproportionately hurt workers from rural areas. These vests are mandated to, be, to carry in your car when you travel, so it became the perfect symbol for this protest. Anybody recognize these hats? Wow, there's our red hat of liberty just a couple years ago on our protests. So these, these moments, these objects, they, they, they help link us to, to people before us that were protesting to something similar. To, 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 it's, it's opportunities for us to grab onto that strength and that textile and pull it into our contemporary moment. Um, all right, so um, perhaps one of the most effective forms of fashion and clothing as protest is the slogan t-shirt. Um, this is from 1968-1969. It is an anti-war t-shirt created by the Harvard uh, University students during sit-in protests. And this is an image now you can still purchase. This is a very uh, popular um, protest shirt. In 1984, Catherine Hamnett trolled Margaret Thatcher. Um, this is a reception held at 10 Downing Street for the London Fashion Week designers in 1984. And uh, Catherine Hamnett, she's a fashion designer, and she showed up with a custom shirt that she had created the night before. And she had covered it up with her jacket and she tied it so nobody knew. And she comes in and moments before she walks up to meet Margaret Thatcher, she opens her jacket, pulls it back because she knows the press is right there and they're going to capture this historic photo. Margaret hasn't read her shirt yet. 58% um, don't want Pershing. This is an anti-thermonuclear war statement. It's against the proliferation of what are now known, uh, or what were known as American cruise and Pershing cruise missiles um, that were, were being distributed across Europe. Other protest t-shirts, more contemporary t-shirts. Um, in 2015, Pierre Moss released They Have Names. It was a listing of 13 unarmed black men that were killed by police. All proceeds went to the American Civil Liberties Union, and that's really key. There are a lot of, a lot of shirts that you can get that have protest messages, but you need to be aware of where the money is going. Make your own. Make your own protest shirt. Or if you're going to buy one, make sure you know where that money is going, because that's really critical. And so uh, Kirby uh, Jean Raymond, the designer of Pierre Moss, he didn't release this shirt for a long time because he was really concerned about that. Uh, a, a, about profiting from it, so all proceeds from this go to the ACLU. Um, he then released, um, this is part of that collection in 2016. He then uh, uh, also released um, a similar shirt inclu including uh, just women's names, and then in 2016, a third shirt um, to update from the last two. 
Anybody watch the Met Gala a couple weeks ago? It was great. There were some really fun fashions and some interesting protests or attempts at protests. This one to me fell very flat. Peg the patriarchy. Great. That's really great. That's a really bold thing to say. Um, there's a lot of controversy about this. There's a Canadian artist that's saying that's hers. She came up with that. And that Dior stole it and hasn't done anything about it. That controversy is still going on right now. Um, so that's a problem when, when fashion designers get involved and try to forward a message. Because, um, I mean, at first glance, this looks like really like a really fun, cheeky poke um, at class inequality. But it's really quite tone deaf and opportunistic. Um, fashion supports protests when it's crafted by the protesters. When we make things that represent how we feel or are part of a significant moment, they become infused with that energy. Remember that phenomenal power that we talked about infusing into clothing? That's what we do when we are creating objects of protest ourselves. Now, the saving grace during the Met Gala for me in this vein of fashion as protests was this moment with Billie Eilish. Regardless of the, I mean, she just looks amazing. Let's just take that for a moment. But she agreed to wear this incredible gown by Oscar de la Renta if, and only if, they commit to no more fur. They are not going to sell any more fur, but that was her requirement. And they agreed. They agreed to that. And I will point out they didn't include leather, so I'm not quite sure how that's all going to work out. But the point here is she leveraged her position and her ability to wear that dress to make social change. That's fashion as protest right there. So now I would like to hand the mic over to our next speaker. We have with us tonight a talented local designer and business owner that is also connecting fashion and social issues. Jared Yazzie joins us from Tempe. He just recently opened a new storefront, and so just let's all congratulate him on that. Um, his work is available online, so I want to make sure that everybody knows to um, hop online and check out OXDX Clothing. It's available in his store in Tempe. And Jared, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and your incredible mission and passion to our group tonight. Thank you so much for your time, and I'll come back after for any questions that you might have. Hello, everyone. I'm from Tiziaken, Arizona, uh, northern Arizona. I'm uh, 32 years old. I've been designing and creating fashion since college. Um, started my brand OXDX Clothing in 2009. Uh, here's an example of my work we recently showed in Canada for the Otsopayaki Fashion Week. Uh, we have a lot of different pieces that we kind of uh, fused together a lot of different collaborations and projects um, and they were all standing roving models within this fashion week so we have a mission statement that is to preserve culture by passing on stories through art fashion and creative content to be socially conscious constantly connected to our community and ambitious as hell so it took us months to create this. A mission statement is important for a business to, to thrive. You always want to look back at this statement to see if you're following what it's supposed to be. Uh, so OXDX will always look to this, and this is how we make our decisions on the next project. Are we still telling stories? Are we still preserving our culture? Um, that's the answer right here. So uh, parts of my work, uh, graphic design, I'm a self-taught graphic designer, so I uh, was going to school for engineering. I was at the U of A with the full ride scholarship uh, as an engineer and completely failed. I dropped out, and in the meantime, I was messing around with Illustrator. I was uh, drawing on my notebooks. I was taking pictures and scanning them and doing them in Microsoft Paint and really just finding anything I could to put my art onto something else. And uh, digital artwork is just something that came easy to me. I was learning through YouTube, I was learning through friends. I uh, really found a motivation when I was working at a screen printing shop and my art director there kind of mentored me on to do more uh, in-depth pieces. So the pieces we have here are the Futures Indigenous on the left, 
Um, that's a Navajo woman wearing a traditional rug dress, sitting on a stack of books, sort of a transition from old to new. And then uh, Support Indigenous Resistance is a collaboration we did with the, the Hundreds in LA. And that is a depiction of a front, like front line uh, resistance. Uh, below it is Grandma Anarchy. Uh, one of my personal favorites, that is a Navajo grandma weaving an anarchy rug. And then Desert Floral is kind of hidden on the top. Uh, M Police Violence is on the bottom. M Police Violence became a poster campaign. We were contributing in Seattle, which is uh, global now. They've, uh, we offer that piece for free, download online. And uh, you can download it, poster it, do whatever you want with it. And then uh, say what we have left is the top right, and Beaded Woman is the bottom right. Another portion of our work is fashion, uh, streetwear, screen printing. Uh, you can see examples of that here within photo shoots we've done, uh, campaigns we've done, uh, fashion shows. We like to work with all native people, so we have uh, native photographers, native video, uh, film, and native models as much as we can. And of course, most of the art is created by me, but we also do a lot of collaboration. Um, so we got Kevin Duncan on the top, or on the left. Uh, we did a uh, fashion show in Santa Fe. Um, during Indian Art Market, we created our own fashion show. Uh, because Indian Art Market doesn't exactly have a category for us, so we do our own show, invite people over, and uh, th those are pieces that we showed for ourselves. Um, and then a, a lot of examples that we can talk about. Another example of work is screen printing. I've been screen printing since, I, I don't even know, I was trying to figure out before this, I think 10 years I've been screen printing. Um, that was the art form that I thought could really fuel just getting the graphics I wanted out into the world. So when I first started, I wanted to be a graffiti artist, and that was not working out for me. I am a bigger dude. I can't run away from cops. I'm not trying to get arrested. I'm not trying to um, pay for bail every time. So I was trying to find an art form that would sort of act as a billboard, sort of show my, showcase my art in the way street art and graffiti does. Um, you're sort of forced to see these things the way you're forced to see advertisements and stuff like that. But um, my work, like the shirt shown here, says don't trend on me. Uh, specifically talking about trends within costumes or um, you know Halloween dressing up or uh, sports mascots, that type of thing. It's really uh, something to step on Native people to um, characterize them. Um, Another portion of work that we do is collaboration. So uh, the one on the left is a dress I created with Jamie Akuma. She's a world-renowned bead, beadwork artist. Um, I created the pattern, which is based off of a chief's blanket. Uh, I created this wool blanket, which you can actually see here on the model. And uh, the wool blanket is called Tribute. Uh, I call it a collaboration with my, my grandmothers. So I've both my grandmothers uh, passed away when I was very little. They're, they, I don't, I didn't have much communication with them. They only spoke uh, Navajo. I don't speak any Navajo. Um, very few. I can introduce myself and sort of get around. But uh, it's very difficult language, and it's very interesting that uh, we go from my grandparents who only spoke Navajo to my parents who were in the boarding school system, speaking both to completely taking it out of the picture with me, my brothers. Um, my oldest brother can speak the most. He actually lived on the reservation. He lived with my grandparents through a lot of his life. Um, then my middle brother knows some because he's really smart. But me, I really like didn't catch a lot of it. Um, but my grandmother's works are featured within this blanket. Uh, they were both weavers. When I had the opportunity to work with a generation on a wool blanket, I. Uh, really wanted to take it home. I wanted to research to do it the right way. I uh, asked my mother about these blankets and she pulled them out. She actually had some to show me. And I noticed a lot of details when I was working with it. And um, when I asked my other aunt, who was a weaver that was still living, 
about my grandmother's blankets, she could really pinpoint where my Nully lady was from. My Nully is my dad's mother. Um, and I'm talking to my aunt on my mom's side. She could tell where she lived because of what she wove, because of the color of yarn that she used and the designs that she was using. So it was really telling the story of where she was from. And um, this blanket is how I wanted to tell my story as well. So, you know, I'm, I mixed a lot of different things in it, but also pulled from the past. Um, another collaboration we have is with the hundreds on the top right and the bottom right. A uh, big company in LA, uh, one of the founders of the streetwear movement. They're really grandfathers in the, in the whole game, and it was really exciting to work with them, and they gave us a lot of leeway, a lot of freedom to do whatever we wanted, even changing their billboard in their Fairfax store to say Tongva Land, which LA is on top of Tongva Land. Uh, this is back in the day. So if we talk about my journey, I started within a garage. I was hand painting items to sell on Facebook. You can see some of that work here. Um, really just getting a feel for art. Uh, I didn't know how to sell these pieces. Uh, I would post them just as to showcase to people. People would ask if they could buy them. Soon I was running auctions on Facebook. So I would just say bid by a dollar, ends at midnight. And some of these pieces would sell for 130 bucks, 140 bucks sometimes. Uh, had a piece sell for 160 before. And it just really showed that there was a need for it, there was a demand for it, and helped me to keep pushing on. And I have a, uh, so this is the story of OXDX as a brand, how we uh, started. A lot of people ask, what does OXDX mean? So I have uh, this track for you to listen to real quick. And we can play the track. They thought it was cool to burn crosses in your front lawn as they owned you from trees in your backyard. They thought it was cool to leave you thirsty and stranded. Katrina, he thought it was cool to carry a gun in his classroom and open fire of Virginia Tech Columbine to stop the violence. They thought it was cool to tear down the projects and put up billion dollar condos, gentrification. They think it's cool to stand on the block hiding product in their socks making quick dime bag dollars. They think it's cool to ride down on you and blue and white and unlock cars, busting you upside your head. Freeze. Because the problem is we think it's cool too. Check your ingredients before you open those on the cool. So that is a spoken word uh, poem. Uh, titled Baba Says Cool for Thought, that's in front of Lupe Fiasco's album, The Cool. Uh, really influenced me when I was starting. Uh, this is back in uh, 2009, so this album was in 2007. Um, and it really gauged what I was thinking as a freshman in college, coming from a small town, moving to a, big, a bigger town, as in Tucson, and um, sort of watching people and how they operate. Everyone seemed very busy. Everyone seemed really over-consumed in a lot of things. Um, so you could really tell the world was sort of operating um, in a different way than what I remember. Uh, and me and a lot of friends, we always loved going back home. we take trips every now and then, as often as we could. And I remember being in the area where my grandparents lived, uh, seeing how they lived, uh, living off the cornfields, uh, raising sheep, you know, um, it seemed very simple. They were raising all these things and living that life to sustain themselves, and it wasn't hurting or impacting the world in any bad way. Uh, it made a lot of more sense to me than what college was teaching me. Um, so I thought the world around me was overconsumed, overdosed on different things. Uh, overdose clothing was what I started with in 2009, and then eventually became OXDX probably in 2000, the end of 2009 or 2010. Uh, so OXDX is an, an acronym, OD, and the X's are the dots, which is just how I used to tag. That's how I used to do graffiti stuff back in the day. Um, this is our logo, which is based off a Navajo wedding basket. And the story of the Navajo wedding basket is really something that um, stuck with me a lot. It's, a, it's sort of a life journey, and there's a lot of interpretations. In tip, is that the word I'm looking for? In tip, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Interpretations of it. Uh, the one I like is the journey starting from the center. 
uh, being your youth and growing out and out and out to the uh, black and to the red, which is the center of your life, to the end, which is the end of your life. Um, the red symbolizing like land, uh, where you're from, and then the black step patterns are your mountains and your, your valleys, and the middle sometimes represents water and the reflection of those mountains. So it's really the telling of the journey of your life, uh, the difficulties, the, the darknesses and the lights. And um, I wanted to showcase that with, with my logo, which uh, the early version was in the middle, uh, and then our newest version that we use now is on the right. So uh, it's open to the east. Uh, with Navajo culture, we always pray to the east. That's where the holy ones are. And uh, I wanted to show that in reference of like a compass. So north, east, southwest, we are always opening to the east, which is um, something I heard when I went back home. Well, I went back to the res, sold, and uh, there was always a grandma that would just sort of scold me on different things. She was a Wonder Rock grandma, and she pointed at the logo and told me that it should face east, um, just to symbolize it, so I listened to her and uh, turned it to the right. Everyone thinks it's a letter C, but uh, you know we can always have the story to tell about it. These are the very early days. This is me in Wonder Rock at the, um, the fair, selling at like nine o'clock at night, it's probably, 20 degrees, then I got short sleeve shirts I'm selling. Um, we have the flea market in Monument Valley, which everyone's selling like wood, coal, you know, stuff to <laughs> warm your houses or, or tools, and I'm selling shirts. Um, Powell Trail, AC Powell's up top, uh, Gallup Flea Market's in the middle, and then I used to just do uh, talk about post on social media and ask people to come out. I'd be like, I'm at Hastings and Flagstaff for an hour. If you want to come buy a shirt, come buy a shirt. And we'd have people come through and buy shirts. I think the real breakthrough is uh, the Native Fashion Now exhibit, which started at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. They incorporated a lot of Native artists that were creating works today, which was very, a very big and new thing because Native people within the museum setting is always looked on as a, you know, a sepia tone, black and white version of a native person. Uh, you never see anything that's like current. And um, this showcase current artists doing current work. So I was really excited to be a part of this exhibit. It traveled from Oklahoma to Portland to, and then ended in uh, New York City. And this is the Portland Museum, or no, this is Oklahoma. And that's me standing next to the, my design. So the design they accepted was my Native Americans Discover Columbus t-shirt. Very simple. It's just uh, you know four words, text written. Um, a very simple fact that a lot of Native kids know, but we're taught differently in schools uh, that Columbus came, voyaged here, and discovered a whole new land. Which is you know it's weird for us to hear that because we knew of all these tribes that have been here for centuries, that had big economies, that had their own ways of living, and that was all destroyed by Columbus. And um, you can't see it that much, but the, there's a texture on the text, and it's called notebook paper, and it's supposed to symbolize a crumpled piece of paper that was torn out of a history book. This is the impact that it's had since its uh, start. These are all people that have worn it on Columbus Day just to just as a way to show their views and to show togetherness in this issue. Uh, this is my logo that I created for Indigenous Peoples Day Phoenix, uh, which we now celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day, and it's very exciting to see change happen within just you know years that I've had this business. You know, when I started, Columbus Day was everywhere, and now we are slowly getting Indigenous Peoples Day across the whole US and it's amazing to see. The other shirt they exhibited was my misrep tee. Mm -hmm. Misrep is based off of the Misfits uh, band logo and the Cleveland Indians logo. So it's more sort of my way to show us putting the death of this logo, I'm showing it in a skull form. And then uh, you can see a friend of mine, Sierra, protesting it at the Cubs 
World Series and Indians game um, not too long ago. I forgot what year that was, but um, even just a couple years ago, we had the Indians logo everywhere because they made the World Series. A caricature of someone that, you know, is supposed to be me and then uh, kind of made play in fans and TV screens everywhere. And these are the kind of things that affect native youth. Um, these are the kind of things that grow up in a, in a city and in a town and um, it's hard to change views. So we're trying to make those changes now. And uh, we're happy to see the Cleveland Indians change into the Guardians this year. So another thing that has just changed within a few years. Um, so you can see there's, there's impact. These are a few other examples of designs. This one on the left is called Chemical Warfare. I made this back in the day, uh, inspired by protests, uh, Diné people that were walking to each sacred mountain of Navajo land um, in protest because in each of, while walking to these sacred mountains, they had to wear respirators because the air quality was so bad. Um, a lot of uranium was found on the Navajo res, uh, mined, and then once they got what they wanted, just left. So, or they would find a mine, employ native people not knowing the risks, these native people would get sick, and then they would leave. So uranium and cancer is a real big issue within the Navajo Res, and it still is an issue now. Uh, this one on the right is uh, called Together We Rise, or that's what it's called, right? <laughs> and then uh, that is depicting of the Pike Sisters. So these are actual um, sisters. They're San Carlos Apache. Naylin is in the middle. Nijoni's on the left, and Basse is on the right. Uh, they're from San Carlos, and they have been big within the uh, Apache Stronghold movement that are protesting the copper mining that's happening on their sacred lands. This is a commission piece that I did on the left with the Smithsonian Museum in New York. They uh, gave me free range to put a piece in their gift shop um, as in <laughs> that goes with the uh, Native Fashion Now exhibit. So I had free range to kind of create whatever I wanted. Uh, I created this, this design called Prepped. You can see the uh, novel woman here is tying her bun in a traditional tie. She has uh, oil running down her back of her neck and it's just sort of a uh, issue about extraction, uh, native land and uh, preparing to fight for it. The image on the right is called Protect. That is also with the collaboration we did with the Hundreds and features Amanda Blackhorse, who is uh, Diné, really strong within our communities. And she was um, someone who took up the mantle of changing the Washington R Words name into um, like clearing it. And she was successful in that this past couple of years. So again, something that's actual change that has happened within my lifetime. Um, we wanted to showcase her. Uh, we told her to come and dress how she wanted to. Uh, she wanted to showcase the blanket. We showed the blanket and she wanted to hold her megaphone. So she is a prominent woman that, um, that I just wanted to showcase and I had the opportunity to print across you know worldwide uh, brands. These are the situations and the way I see Native people, how we are uh, treated within just living off the lands that we want to, uh, protecting the lands that we are been a part of forever, and uh, protecting water. This is what I saw in my newsfeed. This is what I see every day. Um, and there's friends, even, in these photos. And uh, this is where sort of the, the charge comes from, from me, for my design. And this is also where the inspiration comes from. This is my actual family. This is my mom on the left, holding my oldest brother. She's uh, wearing traditional with, uh, on her graduation day. My grandma in the middle, this is my Nully lady, that's my dad's mother. Um, and then my grandparents on my mom's side are on the right. And I just really think they're so cool. You can see my Che. On the bottom right, he's the guy on the left, and I just think he's 
just the coolest dude that you can, like it's really effortless the way our grandparents dressed. And I try to showcase that through uh, my shoots and the way I design things and uh, fashion shows and you can see some of the current works here. These are other noticeable things that we've uh, been featured in, the Huffington Post, wear these native designs instead of Urban Outfitters. Refinery29 did who you're insulting when you buy Native, in, Native American inspired things. They actually hired a director to come out and do a video with us. That video is still up and it's a great video. And then we were just featured in Vogue uh, last year. So meet four indigenous owned streetwear brands empowering their communities. And that is the piece on the right that they uh, featured. And that's everything. We have uh, examples of work here. And I'd love to answer any questions if anyone had any questions. Thank you, Jared. That was really informative. Um, I, I love knowing that each image that he's produced goes back to an actual person and a moment. Um, it's really, really special, the work that you're doing. Do we have any questions from the audience? Students, I was hoping you all might ask something. I'm going to put you on the spot. Do we have any, any questions about some of the work that Jared's doing, some of this incredible imagery? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I want one of those Native Americans discovered Columbus shirts. We got it. Take take a picture of this screen because you can you can hop on the site here and purchase. And then it, your store is located. What are the main crossroads? Uh, University and McClintock. It's around there. Yes. Since you've been creating, have you found in the last couple of years, especially with the proliferation of other uh, indigenous artists, that more and more young creative people, uh, indigenous people, are becoming interested and in, in sort of releasing their creative energy in this, in this way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've never had uh, a generation like this that was so informative, um, that didn't have tools like the internet and social media. And uh, we find power in that in these next generations. So native people, Navajo people, very, um, they make their craft, they're skillful people, and um, these kind of skills were hard to be translated within my father's generation, my mother's generation, but today we have ways of sharing it, the, way, the tools to share what, what we want to create. Um, for me, I think uh, graphic design, um, clothing is just another tool to show and share our stories. I think that's important for what our grandparents did with what they did um, is to pass on teachings and we're just finding new ways to do that. Um, so this next generation is really stepping up as far as using the tools at their hands to get that kind of message and that teaching out and it's, it's really cool to see. things and wearing them, if, even though it's Navajo fashion by uh, Diné, it, it would look like appropriation. Yeah, I mean, uh, appropriation is always a big topic. Appropriation is the f faking of someone's culture, but this is not this is not something I'm trying to be. This is what, who I am, and this is what has been passed down to me and I never create something that has been on the end or the spectrum of, of sacred or something that shouldn't be shared. There is a, a part of Native culture that should be shared, that should be uh, experienced with other people. And of course, you know, as you're buying these things, you're sharing our stories, you're telling the other people what I'm saying to you now, which is something that I wouldn't be able to get out to other people. I only have so far of a reach. Um, it's very hard to find the time to tell people this kind of thing, and um, it's with help from other people that sharing these stories is 
you know that that happens and that happens with the tea that happens with clothing and um and of course you're also supporting the native community when you buy from a native person that dollar stays within the community i think three times over versus if you're buying from something else and of course we need these type of funds to keep traditional practices going to keep our craft going so it's always supportive and if you even if you don't feel comfortable, maybe. Um, just supporting, donating, sharing, those type of things go a long way. Um, so there's a lot of ways to support Native artists. Um, but always be mindful that, um, but yeah, like what we create is usually okay for someone to, to always to wear themselves, uh, especially with OXDX. Um, but it's, it's great that you can talk with me about it and kind of have that, that mind about it because a lot of people don't. Yes. Yeah, uh, Navajos especially were so, um, they're, they're hard asses. Navajos are, are very strict in uh, the, way you, the way you move about life. Um, and this is why in the beginning days, I, I took my designs back to the res. I would take it back to Monument Valley, especially because they're very old school there. Um, Windorock, because they're very old school. And I would see, like I said, see that same grandma and she would like get mad at me sometimes because usually I've had misrep, you know, don't, don't, don't make anything including death, you know, don't, don't showcase that. It's not what you're supposed to do. Um, which, you know, it was a decision on my end that it was important to show it, that it was important that this sort of message got out there. Um, so I think there is a transition. I think there is sort of a, a way in yourself, the way you have to decide it, uh, what, what you are going to do. And I think for us, it's going back to like that, uh, that beginning slide of our mission statement. Is what I'm doing, doing what my mission is? Is it sharing stories? Is it, um, is it ambitious? Is it creating creative content? And is it, you know, conscious of the community? Um, if it is, I think it's okay to do it. Um, another thing I talked about was how resources were available to us. Uh, a lot of sort of the traditional ends of um, Navajos would, sort of be stuck in this sort of era. And if you go outside of it, it's, it's bad or it's not Navajo. Um, but because I am Navajo, because I am someone who lived off the reservation, that is my story now. I, uh, I was a border town kid and um, the stories I'm creating are stories for someone else that's also Navajo. That's a lot of our stories now because we're all displaced people now. We're not, we don't have the luxury of being from, from home, but from the res. Um, so our stories are changing and they're different. And I think uh, this blanket itself also tells how um, I can share traditional teachings but also create in a new light. So it, it is difficult for me. I always have, um, I sort of go back on myself all the time and I, I doubt myself a lot. Uh, but going home and asking questions is always the key. Uh, you know, asking your elders and just sort of, you know, talking in your head if, if that's what you want to do. I think we've got time for one last question and then we have our student winner to announce. Sir? What new collaborations do you have coming up or new projects that you're about to unpack? <laughs> um, new projects. Uh, the newest is a uh, Lifelong collaboration with my fiance, Ali Stone. Ali is a, uh, a textile weaver artist. Uh, we met three years ago, um, and now we're, we, we run this business together. So a lot of the jackets, um, those type of pieces are all her hand sewn work. So I don't, I haven't been a, a, someone that has gotten into sewing, but I've always loved it. So each of those specialty pieces are all from Ali. Um, but the, the newest thing that we've, the project that we've been creating is, is the storefront. So if you have a, 
you know, an opportunity to be in Tempe. It's uh, near ASU and it's on university, um, but we have a lot of our new projects there. Uh, but I think the newest is a uh, collaboration with some uh, native coffee roasters. So we're making a coffee cup and uh, showcasing that in a box that sh has native roasters from Oklahoma, from California, from Arizona, kind of all over the place. And then uh, also eighth generation. We just did another blanket release, and we are going to do another one next year, along with a lot of new projects for 8th Generation. So they're a native-owned business out of Seattle. Thank you, Gary. So I encourage you all, as we wrap up, before you go, to come down and take a look. Please don't touch. But also, make sure you look at these shoes. They are so cool. And I keep asking where I can buy them. And they keep telling me that they're not for sale yet. Maybe if enough of us ask. Um, but something really cool I wanted to point out is that the, the soles are made out of reclaimed tire treads. So each step is, leaves a very individual and custom mark, which I think is just very lovely. Um, thank you, Jared. That was really inspiring.